All right, folks, well, welcome. Uh, I'm Joe Tomei. Uh, I teach here at the law school, and uh, we're really excited for today's CACR speaker series to have Eva Galperin, the uh, Director of Cybersecurity from the EFF, here to provide a talk and do some Q&A at the end. Uh, just a couple of brief uh, administrative announcements first. Uh, there's a sign-in sheet that's going around, and if you guys would mind uh, signing it, it would be very helpful because the more people that we have come to these things and can account for, the more we can continue to have these, so we appreciate you taking some time to do that. Uh, next, the uh, next CACR Speaker Series uh, takes place here on uh, Thursday, March 5th, again from noon to 1 with lunch provided. That is uh, co-sponsored between the CACR and the Center of Excellence for Women in Technology. Uh, the speaker on March 5th is, and I'm sure I will butcher this last name, but I'll try my best, uh, Roshana Anand Dakrishnan. I think that's <laughs> um, so uh, Roshana, I'm sorry? Uh, so, Roshana uh, is the head of products of Globus at the University of Chicago. So, that's the next one, March 5th, and we'd love to have you back uh, again. So, real briefly to introduce uh, Eva, uh, she was born in the Soviet Union uh, at a very young age. Uh, she moved to Rome and then quickly after that moved to San Francisco. Uh, she's now in her 13th year at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, and I'd like to point out uh, that uh, in Style magazine, yes. uh, to quote In Style, she was named as, quote, one of the badass 50 uh, 2020, meet the women who are changing the world. Uh, there was a few above you that I didn't think should be above you, but we can talk to In Style <laughs> next time. Um, in any case, well, what that said, the badass 50 2020, the cybersecurity expert created and heads a privacy and security research group within the Electronic Frontier Foundation that protects vulnerable populations like journalists, activists, women, of, women, people of color, and LGBTQ plus communities. Her goal is to eliminate stalkerware, software domestic abusers often use to track their partners. She says, quote, I'm working on the most badass thing I've ever done, she says. I'm working on destroying an industry. Uh, she is very active on Twitter. It's at Evaside. I asked her what that meant, and she said that uh, Twitter might be the death of her, but based on this last quote, she's working to destroy an industry. Maybe that's a new interpretation of what either side means. Uh, so with that said, please a warm round of applause for you. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, can you hear me in the back? All right, you got me? Cool. Then, then no mic. If at some point I start getting all quiet and whispery and stuff, you guys are obliged to let me know so that you can actually hear me. Uh, so, hi, my name is Eva Galperin and I work for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. How many of you here have heard of the EFF? Almost everybody! That's going to save me so much time. Um, so, uh, for those of you, three, four people who did not raise their hands, and for those of you who are just lying, uh, or who don't actually know what EFF is, uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation is a digital civil liberties organization. Our job is to make sure that when you go online, your rights come with you. Uh, EFF has been around since 1990. Uh, I have not, but EFF has. And uh, that makes us as old as the web, though not as old as the internet. Uh, and there is a long and tedious difference. Um, and EFF came, came about primarily because its founders understood that uh, the laws about technology and data were lagging behind what people were actually doing with technology and data. Uh, so uh, EFF originally uh, started out uh, largely as a, as a law firm. So uh, for those of you who are law students, you may be familiar with, uh, with some of our early cases. Uh, EFF uh, was uh, responsible for the ruling that uh, your, uh, your email has the same Fourth Amendment protections as the mail in your mailbox, uh, notwithstanding the third party doctrine, which we will argue about later. Um, we, have, we sued both AT&T and uh, the US government for, uh, its, uh, for the NSA's warrantless wiretapping uh, program where they just indiscriminately uh, got copies of all the data running through all the data centers and secret rooms all over the United States. Um, 
we have uh, opposed the, the Patriot Act and all kinds of other you know, very serious privacy invading uh, legislation. We have backed uh, privacy protecting legislation, uh, most recently uh, the California Consumers Privacy Act, which I think uh, went into effect um, just a month ago. So uh, people in California are really starting to see the, uh, are starting to see the results of that. And we're starting to see other um, legislatures in other states uh, look at copying this model. Of, uh, of data privacy. So, um, the internet is global and its problems are global and we cannot fix them just with a group of angry American attack lawyers. Uh, and because of that, uh, EFF is now much larger than a law firm. Uh, when I came to work at EFF in 2007, there were uh, 23 people, uh, about half of which were lawyers. Uh, and the organization has really transformed since then. Now there are about a hundred of us. I don't know who everybody is or what they do. Um, I wander the halls going, are you a legal intern? Do you run this place now? I don't know. Um, so now we have a lot of people and uh, we are largely divided into you know, three, three subclasses. Uh, we have lawyers because sometimes the, the answer to your problem is to file a lawsuit. Uh, we do what is called impact litigation. Uh, the purpose of impact litigation is to take on cases that create uh, either good precedent or knock down bad precedent. Um, the idea being that you're not just helping the person who is the, you know, uh, who is involved in the case, but you are trying to help uh, many more people than that at once. You're attempting to punch above your weight to uh, get the most bang for your, uh, for your litigation buck. This is also something that you see uh, the ACLU do, and this is a, a very common strategy used by, um, by civil liberties organizations. So uh, when I first started working for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, my job was to answer the phone. I answered the phone and uh, people called and wanted EFF to take their cases. And they would tell me what their case was, and it was my job to figure out whether or not this was the sort of case that EFF was interested in. And this was shortly after we had uh, started our lawsuit against AT&T for, uh, for the NSA's warrantless wiretapping. Uh, and as a result, we had lots and lots of press, uh, but it also meant that a lot of people in tinfoil hats called and uh, wanted us to uh, do something about the chemtrails. So I spent a lot of time sort of very carefully and patiently talking to extremely distressed people about their problems and trying to pick out what was a sort of ESFE problem that we could do something about and what was a problem for cooperating therapists. Um, or what is you know, simply not an ESF problem. The other, uh, the other big thing that I was seeing around that time uh, was uh, the MPAA and the RIA was uh, running around suing college students uh, for file sharing. So you would, be a, you would go off to college you would go to your dorm, you would download LimeWire, Napster, or any one of the, the ancient file sharing programs uh, of your, and a few months later, you would get a, uh, a letter in the mail from, uh, from a company that claimed to own the IP that would say, we caught you uh, downloading this movie, and because you have downloaded this movie or this album or whatever, uh, give us $2,000 or we will sue you. Um, an interesting variant on, uh, on this plan was uh, to do the same thing with porn. The idea being that nobody wants a lawsuit uh, in which they are named followed by the specific sort of porn that they are downloading in a publicly searchable database. So it was essentially a shakedown scam. Uh, so we were seeing a lot of that, and this is one of the ways in which you know you sort of your, your free speech issues, but also your um, your intellectual property issues kind of rise to the top at uh, at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. So primarily, uh, we care about privacy, we care about security, we care about uh, your free speech rights, and uh, we're also really concerned about. Uh, the rights of particularly vulnerable populations because those are the people who get hurt first. So I'll talk a little bit about that later. So we have deployed our awesome uh, group of, uh, of lawyers. Uh, we also have activists. 
Uh, one of the things that we did uh, as part of the activism team, which I moved to after the legal team, uh, was uh, the EFF uh, borrowed a dirigible, which is different from the blimp, uh, from Greenpeace, and then we flew it over the Utah Data Center, where the NSA was storing all of the uh, all of Americans' user data, um, so that they would know what it felt like to be spied on. Uh, they did not appreciate it <laughs> for some strange reason. No one from the NSA came and told us that we were being adorable. No, not even once. Uh, so uh, sometimes your solution is not filing a lawsuit. There are things that cannot be fixed with a lawsuit. Sometimes you have to, um, you have to get people out into the street. Uh, you need to get people protesting. You need to get them to sign a letter. You need to get them to call their congressman or their senator. Uh, you need to get them to take action against a company or to tell us how uh, a certain policy is affecting them. And for that, we have our activism team. So what activists do is uh, they often specialize in things like you know, surveillance uh, or the problems faced by especially vulnerable populations or intellectual property, and they think up the, uh, the campaigns that we run uh, around these issues. So we have a, we have a meeting which we uh, were not allowed to call propaganda team in which we all sit around coming up with campaigns. So uh, among the campaigns that, uh, that we did, uh, we have a, uh, a sticker which, uh, which says, I do not consent to the search of this device, which is uh, part of our uh, campaign around surveillance self-defense. The idea being that you go to a, uh, if you go to a protest or if you're in a situation where you're likely to run into, a, uh, into law enforcement, uh, and they seize your device, immediately they know that you do not consent to a search. Um, there is also a bunch of very, very small uh, lettering around um, how you actually have to insist that you do not consent to the search. But it's a good reminder, which is very important. Um, so we do all kinds of campaigns. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the work of Cory Doctorow. All right, an, an obscure writer of children's books. Um, a man who writes dystopian science fiction, or as I call it, the news. And so we have our own propagandist. Uh, he uh, has written a really wonderful series of uh, young adult novels uh, called Little Brother. Uh, and I think the latest one is coming out this year, and I'm very excited about it. Uh, the idea being that we are going to convert the youth. Uh, and a lot of the content is, uh, it's based around ESFE issues. So he talks a lot about how um, the control of intellectual property by just a few companies uh, is preventing you from being able to uh, take apart the stuff that you buy legally or reverse engineer the software that you, uh, that you purchase um, or even uh, lend an electronic book to a friend. Uh, these are all things that are increasingly hard to do in this world. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with a, a recent uh, case, in, in, not a legal case actually, um, a recent situation in which uh, the, I think the Caterpillar company uh, had placed uh, uh, digital rights management software on, uh, on their bulldozers, no, on their bulldozers, on their tractors. So possibly also on their bulldozers, who knows. Um, but they, there was DRM on tractors, as a result of which there, uh, there was suddenly a market for uh, second-hand Ukrainian tractors because they did not have DRM on them. And we got a lot of American farmers suddenly buying tractors from Ukraine, uh, largely because then they wouldn't have to pay uh, Caterpillar uh, for the software and for software updates and all of their information wouldn't be sent back uh, to, uh, to Caterpillar about exactly what they're doing. So um, DRM has, has changed the world so that when you buy something, um, you don't own it anymore. You lease it. You rent it. It's really somebody else's. 
And that's a very serious problem if you want to be able to do whatever you want with the things that you have bought. Um, and this particularly comes up with the, with the right to repair and with your right to like own your music or your books, um, not to have to buy the same thing over and over again in a variety of different formats, uh, being able to lend these things to friends, a thing which one cannot do with ebooks very often. Um, so that is what our activists do. Uh, and then we also have a team of, uh, of technologists. So back in the 90s, at the dawn of time when dinosaurs were roaming the earth, uh, a man named Seth Schoen uh, at uh, UC Berkeley came to ESF and said, you need a technologist. And the lawyers turned to him and they said, a what? And he, he said, a technologist. They said, are you going to fix our computers? No. I am not going to fix your computers. I am going to explain to you how computers work so that you can explain it to everybody else. And then you're going to explain how the law works to me. And between the two of us, we're going to figure out what the law should actually look like so that it reflects how technology actually works. Uh, that young man still works uh, for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, I have a friend of mine who went, uh, who went to school with him and said that one day Seth simply disappeared and it was understood by everybody who knew him that he had gone to a better place. I think he was not going to finish school, which is probably not a good thing to be telling uh, people at a university. Uh, there, there is no life outside of school. Get all the education that you can. There are no other paths to success. <laughs> so, uh, so we have technologists. And uh, in addition to explaining uh, technology to legal people and having the law explained to, to us, uh, our technologists work on a whole bunch of projects. So we have, uh, you know, we have software engineers. Um, how many of you here have heard of CertBot? Okay, a few people. Um, so uh, EFS helped build this tool to encrypt the web called CertBot. And CertBot makes sure that you could get an SSL certificate with like two clicks and no money. Um, and this means that when you build a website, you can make sure that it is sending all of its data uh, over the internet uh, encrypted over SSL. Uh, the reason why this is important is uh, because for a very long time, it was very easy to spy on all internet traffic because it was unencrypted. So all of the ISPs could see everything that you were saying. Um, and in fact, anybody who got on the network with you, if you're, say, like in a cafe logging onto their Wi-Fi, could see what you were, um, could see your passwords. They could see what you were posting to Facebook. They could see what you were writing in email when people wrote emails. Uh, they could see the contents of all your chats. They could see all of your photos. It was incredibly revealing, the unencrypted web. I do not recommend it. Uh, and if you think that is alarming, um, it was also being used uh, not just by the U.S. government, but also by authoritarian governments to spy on, uh, on journalists and activists and dissidents. So we made a lot of people much safer uh, by encrypting the web. And I think something like 90% of all, uh, of all web traffic on like the Mozilla browser now is, uh, is encrypted. So we've, we've <coughs> made great, great strides in this area. Um, when I was told, I think like seven or eight years ago, oh, we're going to encrypt the whole web, uh, I thought that this was a really ambitious project. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you're going to, no, no, how, how are you planning on doing that? Um, but it looks like it has largely succeeded, and that feels good. Uh, other projects that we have worked on uh, is the uh, HTTPS Everywhere. Uh, how many of you here are uh, familiar enough with your browser that you, you know that your uh, you know, the, the bar at the top shows a URL, and before the URL, it says HTTP something, 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 something. Um, so if it says HTTP colon slash slash, your traffic is unencrypted. If there is an S at the end, that S stands for secure, and that means that your traffic is being encrypted in transit, um, as opposed to encrypted at rest, which I promise I will talk about later. So um, HTTPS Everywhere is a browser extension that makes sure that if there is an HTTPS 
version of the website they are going to, that you will go to that site by default. And this solves the problem that we, were, uh, that we were seeing very early on in the deployment of the encrypted web, which is that there would be an encrypted version and an unencrypted version, and the default version would be unencrypted. So using the encrypted version uh, would immediately make you suspicious uh, to say authoritarian governments or hackers or you know, other people who you think really don't need to know what you're texting your friends. Um, and that was, that was really alarming. So one of the things that we did was we put out this browser extension. Um, within the group of technologists, we have a small subgroup, which is my lab. Uh, so I run a group called Threat Lab. And Threat Lab focuses primarily on the privacy and security needs of particularly vulnerable populations. So, uh, you know, Women, people of color, LGBTQ populations, uh, journalists, activists. Uh, I have traveled all over the world throughout North Africa and the Middle East, throughout Europe, the post-Soviet states, uh, the, um, all over Asia, even though my Chinese is now very bad. Um, and the reason that I did this was I was meeting journalists and activists on the ground in order to understand uh, what kind of privacy and security challenges they were facing. And in order to deal with those privacy and security challenges, EFF um, has two projects. Uh, one is called Surveillance Self-Defense, which you can get to at ssd.eff.org. I may go so far as to, here we go. There's a, there's a board. So that's surveillance self-defense. Uh, and this is uh, EFF's uh, essentially privacy and security guide. Uh, all of our privacy and security advice for you know, best practices as, as an individual. And then we have another project. Oh, uh, SSD, I think, is translated into eight different languages called The Security Education Companion, which you can get to at sec.eff.org. And this is a guide for trainers. So you spend all of this time learning all of this uh, astonishing technical knowledge, and then you go home and you have to fix your parents' computer. Um, and it's covered in malware, and there are no passwords, and everything is on fire. Uh, what do you do? How do you teach them? Uh, everybody is, you know, uh, you're, Everybody in your kid's school is getting, you know, uh, had their accounts compromised. What do you teach them? Uh, everybody in your church is suddenly worried about the government spying on them. What do you tell them to do? So um, all that stuff is, uh, all that kind of advice is available at sec.esf.org, uh, including a very lengthy discussion of uh, how you go out and help your own community. Because Every tech-savvy person be gets recruited by their friends and by their family to become that person with the knowledge of what to do about privacy and security. And sometimes that person doesn't know what they're talking about, and you end up with a lot of, you know, sort of tinfoil hat mythologizing uh, around what you should and should not do in order to protect yourself online. Um, you should not be those people. You're better than that. Uh, you want to give people advice that they can actually use. You want to give people advice that has, uh, that has bearing on their everyday lives uh, and that they will actually do. Because if you walk up to, uh, to someone and tell them, like, well, you, you're going to need uh, you know, 2FA on this account and uh, you're going to need a YubiKey and you should be spending, uh, you should be communicating only using PGP encrypted email and then they don't know how to install PGP, and also they don't have $50 for a YubiKey, then you haven't actually helped anybody at all. All that you did was show up, give a bunch of advice, pat yourself on the back, throw on a cape, and then fly away. Uh, don't be that guy. Really think about the capabilities of the people that you are, uh, that you are talking to, what kind of advice they're likely to take. Uh, for example, I would travel all over the world and, um, Frequently, I would hear people say, well, just 
don't do your activism on Facebook. Facebook is bad. Facebook tracks everybody. Facebook engages in all kinds of like super creepy practices. And um, I turn to these technologists and I say, you ever tried to do activism? Ever tried to do activism without Facebook? Because kind of the point of activism is to go to where the people are. <laughs> If you're doing activism all by yourself, you're not a very effective activist. And so instead of telling people not to use Facebook in their activism, you have to talk about harm reduction. You have to talk about how they can use Facebook in a way that is, uh, that is safe uh, for their privacy needs, for their security needs, and uh, for the privacy and security needs of the people that they're trying to reach out to. Um, in some cases, it will not be appropriate to go to Facebook in order to do some kinds of organizing. But for the most part, uh, you go where the people are. This is what we have learned from uh, the... Oh, the Little Mermaid. Um, she wants to be where the people are. <laughs> Excellent activist. So we have this, this third, third group of people. So uh, I lead the Threat Lab. And in addition to having run around doing all of these trainings and put together these training materials, uh, we have also done all kinds of really interesting security research. So uh, we've done research on uh, APTs. How many of you here know what an APT is? How many of you here think I'm talking about an apartment? <laughs> okay, nobody, that's awesome. Um, so APT is basically just a fancy way of saying, you know, State or state aligned actor. Um, it stands for advanced persistent threat. Uh, the idea being that most hackers who are just after your money uh, or just after certain information um, are not going to be uh, either advanced or persistent. They, you, you do not have to outrun the bear, you just have to outrun the other people who are outrunning the bear or running away from the bear. Um, and when you are up against an advanced persistent threat, that's simply not the case. You can actually watch the hackers go to work in the morning, like just bang on somebody's system until they find a chink in the armor. Uh, and the very first report uh, describing an APT uh, was put out by Mandiant in, I think, 2011. Uh, and it was called, uh, they, they named it imaginatively APT1. <laughs> APT1 is China. Uh, and it, uh, they put out a report about how uh, Chinese government hackers were coming to work every day starting at 9 a.m. and uh, trying to compromise the New York Times. Uh, and the reason that they wanted to compromise the New York Times was they were trying to find the sources for several stories that their uh, journalists had written about uh, government corruption in China. And I am fairly certain that they were not trying to unmask those, uh, those secret sources because they were planning on giving them cookies or some sort of prize. They weren't planning a surprise party for them. Things were going to go very, very badly for these people. So this is a case in which, in which, um, in which hacking is linked directly to uh, human rights violations. And also a case about how important uh, journalism and the protection of sources is uh, in the United States. Because the, the journalism is done here, the computers are here, the servers are here, and they need to be locked down if we want to protect sources in China. Um, in 2012, I, uh, I interviewed Andy Carbon from NPR, who had done all kinds of really interesting work um, reporting from Syria at a time when, uh, when journalists were banned from Syria at the beginning of the, of the Civil War. And I asked him, so what tools do you use? And he said, well, uh, in order to communicate with the people that I'm talking to inside of Syria, um, I have them use Tor. And I asked him why. And he said, because all of the people I know who didn't use Tor are dead. So again, there are direct links between choosing the right tools when you're doing your reporting uh, and when you are making technology and, um, and human rights abuses and people dying. Uh, so the work that I did was uh, largely about uh, sort of the lesser known APTs. A lot of work had been done on, uh, on China, on Russia, on um, the Five Eyes countries, so US, Canada, 
uh, UK, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, and you know, it's sort of your sort of large, robust, uh, robust cybersecurity empires. Uh, Israel, for example, very small country, very, very large cybersecurity uh, presence. Um, so those are actors that were reasonably well understood because people kept writing reports about them. People who were doing uh, who were doing security work wanted to show off how good they were at security by going, "Ha ha! I have found the you know." the software used for spying by GCHQ. And that was a good way of saying, you know, my, I have skills, you know, uh, come buy my product. And what people weren't doing is they weren't reporting on how uh, activists in Syria were being spied on, or how activists in Lebanon were being spied on, or how the uh, diaspora in uh, Vietnam was being spied on. And that's because the tools and techniques that, uh, that these actors were using were not very sophisticated. They were basically just sending phishing emails. I once received a phishing e email from the Vietnamese government. It was very sweet of them to send malware directly to me. They were, they were not aware I did malware analysis. <laughs> and it came in the form of an invitation to a conference in Asia because, again, uh, it's not very sophisticated, but it does show a strong understanding of what motivates activists, which is a desire to go to exotic places, have their opinion heard. If they really wanted me to, to click on, uh, on their phishing uh, email, they really should have offered me free flights and hotels. I was extremely disappointed they did not offer free flights and hotels, and furthermore, that their attachment was written in Comic Sans. <laughs> Sure sign of malware. <laughs> hmm? Comic Sans, sure sign of malware? Oh, yeah. That's uh, based on many years of very careful no. Um, <laughs> sarcasm doesn't read very well across quotes for some reason. Um, so I spent all this time working on, you know, the, on lesser known actors. And the reason that I was working on these lesser known actors was because they were less sophisticated. Therefore, the work was easy, and I am very lazy. Um, <laughs> But also because uh, the effects were still human rights violations. The, the, these are these very simple things that people were doing, these very well understood techniques that people were using um, that were still effective because uh, people at NGOs or uh, journalists um, would simply click on a, uh, they, they would click on a YouTube link and they would, you know, upgrade their flash when they were told that that was something they needed to do. And flash is basically malware all by itself. <laughs> um, they would, you know, install this, this weird, you know, word add-on because they were told they needed it in order to see their invitation to a conference in Asia written in Comic Sans. Uh, they fell for it. Um, and later the techniques got more sophisticated. Uh, we started seeing uh, credential harvesting using um, sort of fake social media sites that looked uh, very convincingly like the real thing. Um, so fake Facebook sites, fake YouTube sites, uh, fake uh, Twitter, fake, uh, uh, basically you, you name it. If it has a login, they faked it. Uh, going after uh, Gmail accounts became extremely popular because you're, uh, your Gmail account would be linked to so many other things. So it was sort of like the, the gateway drug into your, uh, into your network. And uh, so we started seeing this kind of behavior, and we started reporting on it. And we started going around the world and teaching activists and journalists and you know, other people in very vulnerable populations uh, to be aware of these kinds of problems. Um, and we made some progress there, like, you know, some mistakes were made, but uh, things got done. Uh, in addition to working on APTs, uh, I had done probably about five or six years of work on APTs, and I uh, had put out you know, dozens and dozens of reports uh, when I discovered that uh, one of the researchers, not at EFS, um, with whom I had been doing these reports, 
uh, was allegedly a serial rapist. And I read an interview with a woman who had uh, come out with a story about uh, how he had assaulted her. And the journalist asked, well, what took you so long? Why did it take you such a long time to come forward? And she said that she was scared. She was scared because she was, you know, some like punk kid in New Zealand and he was a hacker and she was worried that he was going to compromise her devices. He was going to compromise her computer. He was going to compromise her account. And she was really, really scared. And apparently this was something that he had threatened to do. And I got really angry. This pissed me off so much. And, and I did what I always do when I'm pissed off. Um, I tweeted. And what I tweeted in January of 2018 was uh, that if you were a woman who had been sexually assaulted by a hacker, that um, you could contact me and I would make sure that your device would get a proper forensic analysis. Because my understanding of the problem at the time was that clearly there are a lot of very scared women out there and they're not coming forward because they're worried about you know, uh, remote access tools on their devices. And if I could provide them with some kind of peace of mind, then I will be able to make a dent in the universe. 16,000 retweets later, I had accidentally started a project. And I would wake up every morning uh, to emails and Facebook messages and Twitter DMs and all kinds of other messages, signal messages, text messages, uh, carrier pigeon, uh, <coughs> carrying the stories of people telling me about the worst thing that had ever happened to them over and over and over again. <coughs> and here's what I learned from that, because this is actually not that far off from traveling all over the world and talking to activists and journalists, only I stay in one place and all the horror comes to me. Um, so I spent all of this time talking, uh, talking to uh, survivors. And I discovered something interesting, which was that the majority of the problems that people faced uh, were not remote access tools. It wasn't uh, software being installed on their, uh, on their computers or on their phones. It was almost always account compromise. And I did a happy dance because we have answers for account compromise as I'm sure everybody in this room is aware. So if you want to lock down an account, you change your passwords, you use long, strong, unique passwords in a password manager, you turn on the highest level of uh, two-factor uh, authentication that you're comfortable with, um, and ideally that is, provided by your, um, that is provided by whoever has this login, uh, and you use uh, additional passwords as the answers to your security questions, because often the person who is spying on you is somebody who does know the name of the street that you grew up on, or the name of your first pet, or the name of your favorite teacher. Uh, and so answering security questions correctly is one of the ways in which these accounts would frequently get compromised. But the worst cases that I saw, not the most common ones, but definitely the ones that, uh, that involved violence, the ones that involved kidnapping, the ones in which uh, the uh, survivors were the most scared and felt the most helpless, uh, were the ones where an abuser had installed a uh, monitoring program on their device covertly. And one of the reasons why uh, they're so scared is because when you're being spied on, uh, you don't always understand the size or the shape or the limits of the surveillance on you. And that is the scariest part because then your abuser is omnipotent and omniscient um, and you have to act as if that is the case. And that is extremely frightening and very disempowering. So one of the things that I really wanted to do was to make it possible for people to understand sort of the, the size and the shape of the surveillance that they were, that they were seeing. Um, fortunately, there is an entire industry uh, of people who make software that is designed to tell whether or not uh, there is unwanted software on your device. And it's called antivirus. So I 
I had tried out a bunch of antivirus programs, uh, and I discovered that much of the time, antivirus doesn't detect the latest versions of the stalkerware. And uh, I spent some time asking myself why, but it turned out that this was not the most interesting question. The most interesting question was, could I convince them to start? Uh, so I started with, uh, with Kaspersky. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember, but a couple years ago, Kaspersky had a really bad year in the press. And so they needed somebody to say something nice about them. And I am not afraid to pick the weak thing off the herd. <laughs> and uh, so I approached Kaspersky and I said, well, here's what you should do. You should uh, put up these, um, these messages that, uh, that let you know when somebody has installed stalkerware on, uh, on your computer or on your, um, or on your phone. And it should say, you know, here, here is what I have found. And then uh, the user should have a choice about whether or not to delete it. Because under some circumstances, uh, deleting the application and uh, will tip off uh, their abuser and possibly lead their abuser to escalate, possibly to violence or to greater violence than they have already engaged in. So I think it's very important to always leave the decision in the hands of the survivor uh, and not make decisions for them. Um, but even the knowledge that you're being spied on is useful. It offers a certain peace of mind. Once you understand, hey, this phone is compromised, these accounts are compromised, the places where I take this phone um, are going to be tracked by, by my abuser, you know when to leave the phone at home. You know when not to use those accounts. You know to go set up another account on another machine. Um, you know how to create a little bubble of privacy for yourself that your abuser doesn't know about. And that gives the people that, that I have talked to tremendous peace of mind. Um, and also often the flexibility that they need in order to escape their abusers. Um, one of the organizations that, uh, that I have worked with over the last couple of years that is really, really fantastic. Uh, they're based out of, I think, Washington, D.C., is uh, called Operation Safe Escape. And uh, they run a site called Go Ask Rose, which uh, offers advice for uh, victims of domestic abuse for how to get out of their abusive situations. And that includes support for uh, all of their you know, sort of digital lives. Um, because it turns out it's incredibly common in abusive situations for the abuser to be tracking their, um, their victim in some way. Uh, Norton LifeLock just put out a uh, report of a poll that they took uh, with, with a polling company. And uh, according to that poll, uh, the respondents, 10% of respondents admitted to using stalkerware to spy. Um, on a, uh, on a partner or an ex, 10%. Now, I haven't looked very closely at the methodology of this poll because I read it yesterday, um, but that is indicative of a very, very serious problem. Uh, another indication of just how widespread uh, stalkerware is around the world is um, uh, Kaspersky put out a, uh, put out a report after they started tracking these, uh, these sort of stalkerware messages that they started sending to their users. And among their users, they actually saw an uptick over the, the first eight months of last year, since they started this sort of tracking, um, in uh, sort of in the detection of stalkerware by, by their apps. So they saw something like a 25% uptick um, from, not like a 30%, so it's somewhere between 25 and 30% uptick don't quote me, um, in, in the number of, uh, of infections that they were seeing. And finally, as another way to get some idea of how big of the problem is, um, the last summer uh, in the Android store, uh, researchers found, uh, I think, something like four different stalkerware apps that had snuck in. Um, stalkerware is uh, that hides on your, um, on your device is against the, the rules and policies of the, uh, of the Google Play Store, uh, as well as against the rules of the, of the Apple Store, but sometimes stuff sneaks in. Um, 
So they found, they found four applications, and then uh, Google did an investigation and found four additional applications. And when they took those applications offline, they reported that the eight applications had between, between them 140,000 downloads. That's a lot of spying. Um, so this is, this is a very serious problem. And one of the ways in which we have approached it is by going, off, uh, going after the AV companies um, and getting them to sort of create this transparency around, uh, around stalkerware. Uh, I have also uh, helped to create a coalition called, imaginatively, the Coalition Against Stalkerware. Uh, it's against stalkerware. Uh, it includes a bunch of security companies, academics, and uh, practitioners on the ground who are uh, directly helping uh, survivors. And we are all working together to create, uh, to raise awareness, uh, to create uh, training material. And uh, sort of my next big project involves uh, sort of standardizing uh, the uh, the messages and the um, totally losing all my words. Uh, so st standardizing all of the messages around uh, what an AV does when they find stalkerware on on somebody's device. And the idea is that eventually, uh, I will not have to get up in front of a group of people and tell them specifically install Kaspersky, install Norton LifeLock, install uh, Lookout, install Malwarebytes. I can just say install any AV product. All of them share uh, information about what this stuff looks like. All of them give you the same kind of warning. And then if you do find this stuff on your device, you can take that warning to, uh, to the FBI or to your local police. Uh, you can show it to them and we will have done enough outreach that they know what to do. Uh, one of the big problems right now is that if you're being spied on in this way, you have no evidence that you could bring to law enforcement that they can understand. And it's not clear to them what steps to take next. So what I would really like is for victims to be able to come to, um, to their local police with, this, uh, with these messages. Uh, the police then go to, uh, to their you know, local DA. The DA sends a subpoena to the company that makes the, uh, that makes the stalkerware and says, uh, tell me who bought this. Tell me who was, you know, who has been um, spying on this, particular, on this particular MAC address, on this IP uh, at this time. And you can get a lot of information that way because uh, it turns out that the way that this stalkerware works is that you buy it, you download it onto the device, and then you pay the company a monthly subscription fee for access to a portal where all of the information from the device is sitting. And those portals are controlled by the company. And I would like to hang them on that. Uh, so that is another example of the kind of thing that we're doing. What does this all mean for you? Uh, so almost everybody here is, uh, is in academia. Uh, most of the people here uh, do some sort of research. And so you often have to ask yourself, um, what sort of research question am I going to answer? What am I going to do? What, you know, what difference am I going to go and make in the world? And so what I wanted to share with you is sort of the, the methodology that the threat lab uses to decide um, what to do next in order to protect people. How do we decide on a new project? Um, how do we decide, decide to go about it? Uh, what kind of tools do we have for this purpose? Um, and what, what criteria we use? So the first, the first thing that I usually tell people at Threat Lab when we are coming up with projects is um, think about the community that you are looking to protect. Uh, for example, in the, uh, in the stalkerware case, I wanted to protect women who were concerned about stalkerware being installed on their, uh, on their devices. And I then spent a year and a half talking to people on the ground. Um, I strongly recommend that if you are looking to protect a community, that you then spend the next year and a half talking to people in that community 
and asking them very carefully about their problems. Because, again, another thing that you may have noticed from my stockware story, I was wrong about what I thought people needed. And I was wrong about what the best solution would be. And I did not come around to the best solution with, like, the most bang for my buck, the, you know, technical equivalent of impact litigation, until I had been talking to people for a full year and a half. Uh, and this is true of almost every training that I have ever done. Uh, whether I am training uh, journalists at a major uh, newspaper or I am training uh, environmental activists in Southeast Asia or I am training uh, women's rights activists in India um, without a strong understanding of what their everyday lives are like what kind of tools they use, what their concerns are, and what actually protects them, my first assumption will always be wrong. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and go out on a limb and say yours will too. So always, always, always spend a lot of time listening to your community. Um, what I strongly recommend to people who are, still, who are trying to get started in this kind of research is to start with a community you already know well. Uh, start with, you know, with your friends, start with your family, start with your church, start with your school. Like there are already communities that you understand well that you don't have to spend, you know, a year and a half doing a careful anthropolo anthropological study of in order to understand what they're doing. Um, but if you go out into a community that is not familiar to you, showing up with a lot of preconceived ideas about what they need and, uh, and why they need it and what they're going to do is a really good way to make yourself feel good and not actually do good in that community. So don't do that. Um, the other thing that, uh, that I tell people when we're coming up with uh, projects for Threat Lab is uh, I ask them about, uh, about their theory of change. So you've come up with your, with your group that you're going to study, you have studied your group, you have figured out what, they're, what they need, and now you need to think about what they need that you can provide. Because sometimes they need stuff that you can't provide. Um, and I make sure that, uh, that my engineers and my researchers think about what we can do for them, um, that, they, that we understand the landscape within, uh, of services that are available to this population. For example, uh, when it comes to privacy and security training, there is a lot of U.S. money for doing privacy and security training in uh, sort of non-democratic countries. Uh, if I want to do a privacy or a security training in like China or um, even Mexico these days, uh, I, can, I can find U.S. government money to do it. Um, but if I want to do uh, the same sort of training in a non-democratic country that is a U.S. ally, suddenly things get awfully tricky. Suddenly the money dries up. If I want to go and train activists in Saudi Arabia, uh, weirdly there's no U.S. money for that. If I um, am looking at the ways in which the Ethiopian government is, uh, is spying on its citizens, not a lot of money for that. Um, and so that's the kind of thing that I encourage EFF to do, uh, to step in in places where other people are not stepping in. Sometimes the reason that other people are not stepping in is not just that there aren't other organizations, um, but that there are no incentives. Uh, for example, earlier when I talked about how everybody was uh, in the security industry was writing reports about the sort of like large, advanced, sexy APTs. Uh, people would write reports about China, they'd write reports about Russia, they'd be really excited about finding, you know, uh, the CIA software or, uh, you know, implants that were being used by, by the NSA. This was all proof that, you know, that you've got game. Uh, whereas finding some phishing emails that are targeting some, you know, Vietnamese activists um, or Ethiopian diaspora uh, is considerably less sexy. It is not proof of your great technical skills. And furthermore, uh, Ethiopian NGOs don't have a lot of money to spend on, uh, on your fancy security solutions. 
And so writing reports in which you show off that you have found this, uh, you know, um, that you have found malware which is targeting the Ethiopian diaspora is simply not going to happen. And that is the reason why uh, that's the kind of work that EFF does. So what would I like you all to take away from this? Every single one of you does research. Every single one of you is a, is a member of a community that you do understand well. Um, and every single one of you is a, is a hub of information about the law, about technology, about privacy, about security. And what I want you to think about when you go out into the world is how you can use all of these resources for good and how you can also use your research in order to increase uh, civil liberties, both at home and abroad. And we need you to do it, because let me tell you, almost nobody else is going to do it. It's going to have to be you. Thank you very much. I know some people will probably have to leave at 1 for class, but we have the room until 1.15, so I understand people have to go, but if you guys have questions, now is a great time to ask them. Yes. When the EFS is working on its goal to try and make the law catch up to technological progress, do they try to focus on passing new statutes that accommodate new technology? Do they try to write statutes that are flexible enough where it can be interpreted to accommodate new technology? Do they try to encourage more flexible interpretation of existing law in court? Or do they do a mix of all three? In some ways, you could say that we do a mix of all three, but I think that uh, what you're probably missing is the thing that we spend most of our time doing, which is trying to keep crappy laws from getting passed. Um, <laughs> many people uh, respond to something bad happening in the world with there ought to be a law. Mm. And every time somebody says there ought to be a law, there's a politician who wants to know what that law would look like. Um, and the people who write laws often are not people who understand technology um, or law. Or law. <laughs> and furthermore, they will tell you that it doesn't matter. They're like, oh, we'll just pass it and we'll work out the details later. Nothing frightens me like the words, we will pass it and work out the details later. This is bad. The devil is absolutely in the details. The details matter. The details are what are going to affect people every day. Um, so yeah, the majority of our time is just trying to keep bad things from happening. There might be a couple of questions on Zoom. I just noticed the chat keeps popping up. Ah. Anybody online have a question? I was reading they out loud. Yeah. Well, I have a question. I want to kind of play devil's advocate talking about right to repair. All right. So let's say that I'm John Deere and I say, well, you don't understand, Eva. What we're trying to do is create a more secure system so the right to repair interferes with our cybersecurity. work like this, uh, there's, there's usually a point at which uh, security and, uh, and privacy, or in this case, security and right, and right to repair, butt up against one another. And what I say to that is you ought to have a choice when you buy the product of whether you want to continue to buy into the, um, to the vendor's DRM, 